ni hao. Welcome to Interview with Miss Panda. I'm your host today, Amanda Shon Blodgett. My guest today is Angie Drake, founder and author of Not Your Average American Blog. Angie is a prolific traveler and has lived in several countries. She is dynamic, travel writer, and photographer. Currently, she writes about living and traveling in Ecuador and South America. Her writing and photos will lead you to experience different cultures, diverse people, and beautiful lands in a brand new way. Furthermore, Angie has been a expert homeschool mom in different countries. I am very excited to have Angie with us today. Hola, Angie. Thank you for joining us. Hola, Amanda. Thank you so much for asking me to join you guys. I'm happy to be here. And, and let me apologize in advance if you hear any drilling in the background. I'm afraid the um, neighbors have decided they needed to get some construction done today. And hopefully um, it will be at a minimum. All right, no problem. And actually, I have been doing several in interviews, um, um, you know, this year. And then it's always has been in, I am in Ecuador and uh, my my um, my friends or my guests are all in another country. This is the first time I'm doing an interview with a special guest actually in the same city and country as I am. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to, uh, I think no problem with the tree cutting, the trimming, and then the construction in the, um, in the um, uh, where in our neighborhood, I think that the uh, our um, audience is going to understand. Um, so, Andrew, um, you actually, you are an expat um, now, and you actually also were an expat child growing up. Can you briefly share your uh, family heritage cultural background with Elizabeth? I sure can. Um, my dad was, is American, um, and he was in the military for over 20 years. So I grew up traveling from military base to military base, much as my kids have done with us. My mom is English. So our very first home um, that I can remember was actually in England. And I was raised more as an English little girl than an American little girl for my first six years. And then after that, we moved again several times. Um, I've been fortunate to live in several different states in the United States as a child, as well as England and the Philippines. So it gave me a good idea what I was getting into when I married my husband. <laughs> wow, that that is quite interesting. And actually, it's almost like it's a it's a seed planted in you for since you were a little girl. So now you're doing the expect lifestyle again, and then um, and then you start this blog called Not Your Average American. Why do you name your blog Not Your Average American? Well, it. it I debated about it, but when we lived in Germany, uh, we a lot of our German friends were, we heard this repeatedly, you guys aren't like normal Americans, are you? And um, we would have to explain that not all Americans are alike, and that actually there is really no average American at all, but people that are from other countries are still convinced that there is an average American, and they're the, the Simpsons from the cartoon show, or they're, um, they're people from sitcoms and from movies, and we're not those people, and most Americans aren't. And then when I started writing for the South American, more, more about South America, I began to realize, after living in Buenos Aires, that it's not just North Americans, it's not just, we call ourselves Americans, but people in South America call themselves Americans too. And so writing about Not Your Average American became more than about my own life. It became about every American I was meeting in South America and sharing their stories as well. Right. So it is like you are giving it a broader meaning of being American. It's just not a Americans from the United States, but yeah. you know, you're know you including more people in your perspective. And I think that's definitely very interesting to see a different perspective of when you are traveling or living abroad and then see, and we see the world in a totally different direction. I, I think that's a, quite interesting. And you actually write extensively on South America, from Uruguay, Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, to Ecuador, where we both live right now. And you see people and places through your curiosity and camera. What I find most fascinating about your travel writing is that 
they are beyond just visiting the tourist attractions or finding the best place to to have a great meal you discover the most delicious food food or a food stand or food vendor in the least noticed place on the way to your final travel destination and you touch on local artists festivities food cultures within a culture geographic differences and most importantly people ordinary people um, at a little town or at, um, at a workshop you have interesting stories to share by talking to the people who are not known to the public but are glad to share stories so my next question for you is what is the major difference between traveling to a place for a short period of time and living in a country for a year or longer living living in a country obviously you get to know people much um, much better you get to develop friendships and um, through those friendships then you get to meet even more people and it's it's um, it's almost like a domino effect once you start to meet people it rolls it just keeps on rolling and you keep on meeting more and more and more and so our cultural experiences here in Ecuador can be deeper and more meaningful if I want to learn about, um, for example, I just wrote an article on roasting guinea pig and the potential market for eating guinea pig in the United States. I just called a friend and said, hey, do you happen to know someone who has a guinea pig farm here in Ecuador? And she does. When you go to visit a place on a short-term basis, it's much harder. You can still ask those questions, but if people, if you haven't developed a relationship, with people, uh, a little bit of, of confidence and trust, it's much harder for someone to say, oh, sure, go visit my friend who's down in the valley. Um, it's just much harder. It's not impossible, but it's harder. Yeah, but I think, I think you probably get an insight of the background of the guinea pigs or more. <laughs> or yeah. well, and, and we, we, we face it from, we look at it from through local eyes in a much, I'm not just seeing it with the culture shock of American eyes going, oh my God, they're eating a guinea pig. Um, because I have friends that have been raised this way and, and this is the way they live and they can't even imagine that for some people this is, it's horrifying for some people. They can't imagine that. And I, I see it sort of as my job to bridge those different, those cultural gaps and to help Americans from the United States not see things with shock but to see things through another cultural lens. And if I can do that in just a little way, I think I'm succeeding. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that the first time I visited single Gi in, in uh, Ecuador, I saw all the guinea pigs on the, on the sticks and then barbecued um, guinea pigs. I basically, I was like, wow, actually they, for me, they really look like little baby pigs. And the thing is like, sometimes because it's something you haven't tried, so you have a kind of mental block. And I think what you've been writing about certain things is, I think it's not just a bridging the cultural differences, but at the same time, it's kind of linked the, 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 the everyday life and to, to let people to relate what people are living in a different side of the world. And then kind of like also networking at the same time, because I think when people talk, and, um, and food is always a great topic to start with. And the food is always a great way to, to connect. So I, I think that's, that's really true. I really, I think it's really true because I think you also um, uh, mentioned in one of your articles, you know, you went to a, a little town and I think you tried catazos. It's just like some kind of uh, snack food. Can you share some of the, these cultural experiences with us? I can. They're actually called katsos, and um, I'd heard about them before. I'd had friends share um, experiences on their Facebook pages, so I sort of had an idea of what to expect before I um, before I tasted one. But I was um, I, I was more interested at first in in asking the young woman who was selling them about them and the history of them and the culture of them. They're actually insects. They're bugs, and they only come out um, once a year for a few weeks. And it's right when the rainy season starts. And the people that live in the high Andes are so excited to see them. This is something that they have harvested for generations. And um, before I ate one, I, I, I was a little leery because it's an insect. 
um, but she convinced me to try one and they were absolutely delicious and they tasted sort of like popcorn they were crunchy and they were buttery their heads are gone and their wings are gone so you're eating mainly the body but it was when I got home and I started to do a little more research on them to write about them that I began to realize that they weren't just bugs I was eating dung beetles which oh. sort of really freaked me out at you know, <laughs> eating something that eats dung um, and then you you, you sort of have to separate what's going on in your head. You're, you know, that it's emotionally a little bit shocking. And then um, you, but wait a minute, I ate them. I'm fine. I'm not sick. Um, people have eaten these for years and they're absolutely delicious. So we let, sometimes we let things get in the way of a cultural experience when um, we need to learn to push more things aside. I agree. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, actually, I, I, I think a lot of times it's kind of fun to do the cultural comparison. You know, like you're talking about the kettles, it's an insect, you know, and people eat, eat them here. Actually, in China, they also eat certain kind of insects. And then I think because they are full of proteins. And yeah. then a lot of times, then we go back to guinea pigs because I think there's a reason why they are eating guinea pigs here because maybe they didn't have cows and certain um, chickens and things like that for us. So they raise their own food and they raise their own animals so they can eat to get proteins. I, I think it's because culturally and geographically, it's so different. So that will be developing different way and people eat in different food that people are eating. Do, do you think that's probably a part of the reason? I, I, I know that it is, and I think you even see that divide here in Ecuador. Ecuadorians are not all indigenous Ecuadorians. They weren't all um, from um, native populations. Many of them have mixed blood, um, especially from Spanish-speaking countries, especially from Spain. Obviously, they were the first colonists here. And you can talk about eating guinea pig, and I've met Ecuadorians that are just, they turn their nose up in disgust. They're their um, family backgrounds are very different from those who are raised in the countryside and have lived with guinea pigs their whole life. Uh, but this country, traditionally, in the mountains, guinea pig have been eaten since um, probably before the Inca arrived. Right. Uh, and I'm sure the insects in the same way. And in the Oriente, in the jungles, they eat other foods that we're really not very familiar with. Um, other types of insects and worms and bugs and yeah it's very it is very interesting it is and then I think I kind of like the very regional food even United in the United States you know you have a regional food the southern kind of food California New York and different places you have a different specialties in China in Taiwan in Singapore in e in Malaysia the Philippines I mean even yeah. it's, it's in the Asian um, in Asian region but you have all kinds of a diverse regional food. I think it has something to do with the weather. It has something to do with what they can have or they can harvest in different seasons. So I, I think that's definitely something interesting. And I do think if people are not exposed to it, and then I think we all will be a little bit, hmm, I don't know you have now, if I'm going to try it, like the guinea pigs, my first thought, I was like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> but I think you know, the hardest think part for Americans, <laughs> yeah, for Americans, the hardest part was something like the guinea pig isn't even that it's the guinea pig, it's that it's the guinea pig served whole, and it has its head, and it has its feet, and most Americans are not used to seeing an entire animal anymore. We have a big disconnect between the animal on the farm and the animal on the plate, and so when the animal on the plate looks too much like that animal from the farm, some of us don't want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I, I, I totally agree. I remember um, if you have visited the dim sum place, the Chinese Cantonese food dim sum place with all those little carts, with all those little cages, was a steaming dumplings. I remember one time a friend of mine saw, she, she said, hey, I want to try that. What's in there? So the lady opened up the, key, the, the steam, steamer and she saw all the feet, the chicken feet inside. And she was like, oh my gosh. What are these? And I say, these are called phoenixed feet. Do you see there's a beautiful name for this dish? But if you have never seen things like that, I know I think it will be a little, it will take a little bit of time for you to kind of convince yourself, say, yeah, I don't wonder, I don't understand why those people, they really enjoy it, but I think it's kind of scary. I, I think it's an experience and it's something 
you need to give it a try and to see if you can accept it. And it's a way to kind of learn about the world, the food and everything. So I agree, um, Angie, I think you are a very curious traveler and expat. So you have all kinds of, you experience a lot of a cultural experience firsthand. And also you have been a member of the expat community for some time now. And uh, we're going to talk about your homeschool experience. And your two boys were younger when you lived in Argentina. And now your younger one actually is a teenager in Ecuador. What is it like to be an expat mom with younger children? Or is it getting easier to be an expat mom with a teenager um, overseas? Um, teenagers are hard overseas. It's not impossible, but it's very different. The irony is, our year in Argentina, we actually chose not to homeschool, but we had a homeschooling approach to a um, school in Argentina. We sent our boys to, um, to a local school where there were no Americans so that they could be immersed in Spanish and learn Spanish. And that, that's what our homeschool life was like. We would um, only study what the kids were interested in so that they would really be focused on learning and we decided that that year in Argentina was the year to learn Spanish. They didn't need to worry about their grades in their other classes. And um, it, it worked very well for our family because we were returning to the States and not worrying about entering another school. We were going to be homeschooling again. So grades and having paperwork to pass on from one school to the next weren't important to us. But having that language acquisition really was, and it worked. Um, we showed up in Argentina with very little Spanish, just your basic, um, could you tell me where the bathroom is, please? And um, we could order from a, a menu in a restaurant, and that was about it. And by the time we left Argentina, both boys were going to people's homes, and um, they were actually passing their classes in school, and they had a fluency in Spanish that was really incredible. Kids can learn languages very quickly. Their brains are slightly more plastic than adults. Doesn't mean adults can't do it, they can. Um, but because of that plasticity, when, you're, when, when, when they're just focused on that language so much, it, really, um, it can really stick faster. But the other side of that is that it also meant they got to experience more of Argentine culture. And teenagers in Argentina are very different from teenagers in the United States. Um, Argentines, especially um, porteños, those are the people that live in the port city of Buenos Aires, um, their nightlife starts at about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, teenagers of my oldest son's age at the time, 15, um, regularly started their evenings at midnight. They would go to boliches, which are places to go dance and hang out with your friends. They would get locked in for the whole night, and they would finish at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. That took that took a little um, convincing for us to allow our son to participate in that. But we had put him in a situation where that's what all the kids did, and he wanted to feel normal. And so we found ways for that to happen. Um, my youngest son was a junior high school age student, seventh grade. Their party started at 9 o'clock in the evening and ended at midnight, 1 o'clock. So um, that was a little easier, though a little strange for a 12-year-old, 13-year-old to be going to parties that late. But we we learn to adjust and to manage. Right. Yeah. So you actually, actually for your homeschooling overseas, you actually have a lot of flexibility. I find it's quite interesting because you not only um, decided to send your kids to um, the local school in Argentina to learn the language and also you totally immerse them in the culture because being an expat doesn't mean that you are going to learn the language and, or culture um, automatically. I always say that. Yeah, not at all. And I think for most kids, most expat kids end up at a school where English is the focus. And then people begin to, well, why aren't they learning the language more quickly, the local language? And it, it, it's very hard to learn a language when you're not immersed in the language, especially right. if you're not speaking it at home. And my kids don't want to speak Spanish at home. So mm -hmm. they had to have it outside of the house. They, they had to have it pretty constantly in order to learn. And then my, my youngest son is with us now here in Ecuador. Um, he has chosen not to go to a school here. He's homeschooling. He's, um, he's 16, 17 now. So he's in charge of his own education. And um, his dad and I are guides, and we help him um, 
we help him in some ways, but Connor pretty much handles his own education in his own way. And one of the things was he, he was taking acting classes on the, on the local economy with, um, with a local Ecuadorian acting director and the class was all Ecuadorian, and so everything was done with local Spanish. And his Spanish took off, and that's and he chose to do that on his own. So those are those are good choices, I think, um, for kids that live overseas to have those opportunities to say, "I'd like to go do this." We um, we think it's important that they get the chance to do them. Amanda, I, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can, because I lost your connection. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Can you hear me now? It just okay. So okay. that was good. All right. So yeah. I think what I was, oh, just to recap a little bit. Okay. I, I think what um, I was saying that it, I think it was really good because um, you open the door for your children to let them go to the local schools and then to uh, participate activities in the uh, in the local community and I think that kind of forced them to use the the language of Spanish here and then yeah. also to through the language to learn the culture of course that the language is the medium to to kind of expand your experience that when you can understand the language I, I totally understand because I think we do have a lot of expat friends here including my own kids they go to the uh, international school the major language is English and they they do learn Spanish every day at the school but it's a very limited because it's like 45 minutes a day but the playground language is Spanish. So in that regard, they do have to try to use their Spanish. But I think what is interesting me is actually my daughter, she wants, she wants to learn more Spanish because she has friends in the, the community where we live. There are a couple of girls, they, they like to play with each other, but the girls, they don't speak very much English. And that makes her feel like she wants to learn more yeah, uh, Spanish, so she can communicate with them and talk with them. So I, I think it's a very interesting, like being an expat community is like a, it's like a, a circle or like a bubble. But when you break out that bubble, and then I see you probably your kids will see more things. But a lot of times it's like, are you brave enough? Like you said when you're yeah. Argentina, the timing of the party is different. The, the younger kids go on and stay until twelve o'clock or so. Is yeah. it's kind of break the rule in our own culture. So you need to be brave enough to 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 let go and let them try that. And I think it does that does that consider as it like for you as a challenge as an expat mom. It was more of a challenge in Argentina because it was the first time we'd ever encountered um, such. Um, looseness with teenagers. I mean, in, in the United States, we're so busy trying to control um, teen behavior and make sure they're always in a safe place and um, that they're home by a certain time. And the idea that, that your, your older teen could stay out all night long um, and that it actually was safer to stay out all night long than it was to try to come home by two or three in the morning. Um, those things, it took a while to wrap our heads around, but we didn't have a lot of time. We only lived in Argentina for 15 months. So it was, um, it was like zero to 60. We had to start figuring this out if our kids were going to be a part of that community. Right. And yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's worked well for us. We were fortunate. We had the experience of doing something similar when living in Germany when they were very, very little. 
um, and putting them in a German speaking school. So we didn't have to deal with as much with the, um, the socialization aspect outside of school, but learning how to deal with learning a foreign language. How much do you push your kids to, um, to, to stick with it when it gets really hard? Um, you know, after three months, they're coming to you and going, I don't want to do this anymore, Mom. I, I'm tired of not speaking English, and they don't understand me. Finding that energy not only for them. I mean, you've got to give them the energy and yourself the it, 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 it's a type of bravery, but it's also a type of persistence. Yes. And yeah, it's, yeah, it can be hard, but we, we learned when they were younger what was possible and what they were both capable of, and it made it much easier when we went to Argentina. Yes, well, I, 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 I think it is, there's a comparison when they were very little when they were in Germany and then when they were a little older in Argentina and now in Ecuador. And yeah. I think what you mentioned, I think there's something very important in foreign language learning, being consistent. Yeah, like you said, you know, you, you need to be consistent and then hopefully, and then that will come, come through. So even though people are saying, oh, it's easier for kids to learn a foreign language when they're younger, but look, your kids, you know, when they were, are teenagers, it's still no problem. You just need to have that experiment, um, environment and also being consistent with them and then make, make them grow, grow. And I think that's what the, the job as a parent is to, to help them to, to grow, you know, when, when you have an environment. That's, a, that's a really true. Um, also, so now I think we're going to move on to the part like, I know you have some collections and you have some beautiful pictures because you're such a, um, a wonderful photographer and curious traveler and then I know over the years you have collected and take have taken many wonderful uh, pictures and then have some special um, items cultural um, you know culturally um, um, stuff you would like to show us so we're ready for that okay um, I think when you give me my questions beforehand you actually sort of ask about a unique cultural experience yeah and I'm gonna show you this Whoop, we're going to get it right right back here. It's a little shiny. Yeah. I yeah. Oh, we can see the color leaves. That's, that looks great. This, um, this is actually a painting of somebody's dream. And the man's name is Julio Toquisa. And I met him in a place called Tigua, which is, um, those of you who've traveled in Ecuador will know of the big crater lake called Quilatoa. It's the bright turquoise lake. It's little town near there, yes. and I got to meet this artist. Um, he started painting in this style back in the 1970s, and he was the only person in his village painting that way. And an art collector from the United States came to Ecuador, saw his work, and convinced him he needed to paint more. And um, he ended up teaching all of his sons how to paint, and his sons have taught more people how to paint. And today there are over 300 artists in this small community in Ecuador that paint in a similar style. Um, when we went to go visit this gentleman, he's the founder of a whole new school of painting. But you wouldn't know that from meeting him and talking to him. He's very humble. And he was very thrilled to sell this one small painting to me, even though he can make um, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars selling all his paintings in the United States. He still sells out of his small little um, workshop in Ecuador. And he brought out this huge drum and wanted to show us how to play the drum locally and started drumming away. And then his <laughs> grandson came out and his grandson started to dance with me. And it was just, to me, for all of my memories in Ecuador, these people didn't know us. But they, they, they welcomed us in and they, they shared their culture and they shared. And it, I think the trick that did it is um, that we were listening and that we could understand his Spanish. And I think a lot of people that visit when they can't speak any Spanish, it doesn't, it's not that they can't enjoy themselves. They can very much and the people who are very friendly. But it's that as soon as someone locally realizes you can understand what they're saying and not be struggling, they open up and it all starts spilling out. It's like they've been waiting for ages to tell someone what's going on. And I, I love that about Ecuadorians. They all have something to share. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I love yeah. it. I love it. Anyway. Um, boy, photos? Yeah, sure. Okay. 
I am going to try. This is a hummingbird. I love hummingbirds. I'm get this. I think, can you see him pretty well? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. That hummingbird is called a um, sapphire vented hummingbird. What I want you to notice is there's a little dusting of gold on his forehead. Yes. Okay. I, I chose that one because it, it's another story about Ecuadorians and about culture. All right. When I first saw a hummingbird like that with the gold on his head. Mm -hmm. I was asking somebody what kind of hummingbird it was because it didn't match anything in my books. And they said that, um, that it only happened during mating time that they get this oh. and I, I, I believed this person and um, hmm. talking about it to somebody else and another guide with a little more experience later told me oh no he says it has nothing to do with mating it has to do with pollen in the flowers and these birds <laughs> the flowers it, they're not just going to bird feeders they're going to actual native flowers they stick their heads up in and the pollen gets on their forehead and in Ecuador, sometimes, when Americans ask questions of local Ecuadorians, they don't like not having an answer. And so they'll tell you an answer. And sometimes they think it's true, but it may not be what is really going on. And especially when it comes to birding, birding is not an Ecuadorian hobby. And it's something that the um, Europeans and Americans have brought to Ecuador. And a lot of the guides have not been trained. And they're not, um, they know their local birds, but they don't know necessarily know all the details. And so right. sometimes, sometimes there's, a, there's a little bit of a culture clash going on with, right. with professional, almost, well, very many professional level birders come here. I'm an amateur birder and I love it. Um, but there, there's a definite disconnect sometimes between. That's so interesting yeah. to hear that. Actually, I, I think it's quite interesting to hear that because I think we do see all kinds of hummingbirds here, yeah. and it's quite amazing. I mean, I, I followed your blog, and not your average American. I followed some places you have been to, and then take you know my son, my husband, we, you know, my daughter. We all go together, and it's a very, very fascinating to see the tiny, tiny hummingbirds to the you know bigger ones that the with the big beak and like you said and sometimes we'll ask questions and the the guide i remember one time we went it was a guide he looked at us like a uh huh and then i thought oh i was expecting you to know most of the 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 knowledge about the birds and then after a while i i realized that they don't and then i think it, as a, a curious traveler as you and you actually do a lot of research afterwards to verify everything and i think that's kind of it's a part of the learning along the way and then i think that was really quite really quite interesting actually and it's a learning you know along your your own hobby and then to to take a professional um photographed of birds. I, I think that's a, something quite a, quite interesting and fascinating in a different place. And then talk, you mentioned something very interesting culturally. I think people here, yes, I don't think they like to say no or I don't know. I very like, and it's very similar to Asian culture. People will nod their head even though yeah. they don't they don't know, they don't understand. And I I think it's this thing like when well, you live in a place for a while, you understand culturally and you understand how to make them feel comfortable and just tell you exactly what they know or not. And we've learned here not to ask questions that require a yes or no answer because if they don't know the answer, you still might get a yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, is is um, such and such city down the road? Yes, because they don't want to tell you no. So instead, it, it might be better to say, could you tell me which is the next town? And then right. they'll give you the name of the next town. And then you know you're headed in the right direction. But we've learned to sort of adjust how we ask questions here to accommodate to their comfort level as well. I mean, it's right. so to expect that they should tell us what we want to know just because. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's actually, in a way, it's like being respectful to 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 anybody. I mean, to, yes. to respect their culture, to understand them, to learn the language, and to understand more um, of the culture in, in a country. And, um, I think you know um, we can travel. You know, we, we look at your um, your photos. You know, the, the paintings you collect. Do you have anything else, or if you'd like? I mean, I 
Have you ever seen have something else you want to show? Ooh, look at that. These? Yes, what are these? They're cute. These are actually from Peru. Okay. They're an example. Whoops, I keep I keep moving the wrong Out direction. To the middle. Yes, okay, that's great. Yeah. They're um, examples of what you would find on the rooftops of houses um, throughout the Andes in Peru. Mm -hmm. And they're from colonial times. They're bulls. Here, let me hold up just one of them and you can maybe see. Down a little bit to the middle. Yes. 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 Uh huh. And um, a pair of them on top of your house is considered good luck. And if you are driving through um, in the mountain, mountainous areas of Peru, you look at all the housetops and you'll see a pair of these. Every once in a while, you'll see a pair of llamas instead, um, a more going back to pre-colonial times. And this has made me look at the tops of houses wherever we travel in South America. And you'll notice here in Ecuador, different areas of Ecuador have different things on top of their houses. Yes. Yes. And it, go closer to Cuenca and there's usually a small metal cross. Sometimes yes. it has two doves, sometimes there's two angels, but it, it changes throughout. And so it's really interesting to see the rooftops. Right. Yeah. You've got to look in places that sometimes you don't think to look to see the beauty of an area. Uh, absolutely. Actually, we found out all the top um, decorations I don't, um, because of my kids. They were you know, looking everywhere and say, hey, I noticed, you know, you see in Cuenca all the beautiful crosses, you know, on the on the rooftop and they're all different styles, different um, sculpture. Yeah. So it was definitely quite interesting. Do you recognize this guy? Look at this. You know what he is? Yeah. It's so hard to get the whole thing in because he's got a big hood on him. We want to see the, the hands so that yeah. we can see the... <laughs> He's got chains on his hands. Hmm, why is that? And then I know because in the uh, uh, Procession de Luz, we saw a lot of them coming out. And there's a story, and I think you can share that with us. There is. He's called a cucurucho. And a cucurucho actually means cone in English. So um, in Argentina, you'd get a cucurucho with ice cream. But here, a cucurucho is a person. And it is, um, they always wear purple, and they always wear the cone-shaped cap and they are penitents they are asking for forgiveness for their sins from god and they march in a procession on good friday in quito and it's a couple of miles long and many of them as they're they're walking just wearing the robe and the and the cap is not enough for the level of penitence they feel they need to make so some of them chain their hands or chain their feet um, Many of them walk barefoot on the hot, it used to be all cobblestone. Now it's much of it's paved, but it's still black tar. And Easter time here can be hot. It can also be very rainy and you're walking on the wet, it's slick ground. Mm -hmm. um, there are also other people that punish themselves as they, as they walk along in this procession. And there's a mixture of um, of Catholicism with indigenous culture here. And you see some things that um, are more local to Ecuador that you would never see in other Catholic countries, but have a Catholic feel as well. It's very mm -hmm. interesting, the blending of the two cultures. Absolutely. That's that's why I think it's very interesting from your your blog, Not Your Average American. You, you write things, you know, I see that you see cultures within a culture. And I think that's very fascinating because a lot of times we kind of like neglect that or we just don't, we don't see it. So I think that's definitely, you have a very sharp eye and then, and then to see the insights of certain things. And I think that's just wonderful. Well, we don't want all people to think all Americans are alike any more than Ecuadorians want us to think that Ecuadorians are all alike or any culture. Exactly. Yeah. The, we, we all come from very diverse nations, and sometimes it is just too easy to write us off as all being exactly the same because of the place where we came from. Mm -hmm. And that's just not true. Wow, a great collection. Thank you, and you for sharing sharing all the wonderful collection with us and make us being very curious, and they want to know more about um, 
all the things you know in the world the culturally or the art and everything and you know we can travel with you through your articles and photos on your blog and not your average American at the same time you are an experienced homeschool mom a volunteer in local charity organizations a writer and a photographer what does the term world citizen mean to you uh, world citizen means looking beyond your own borders and um, in a world that um, we're very interconnected now and something that we do in the United States can very easily have an effect on other nations and a lot of times I think we don't want to take that into consideration many nations want to make decisions for themselves based only on what their own nation needs and um, we live on a globe together and um, this comes up with a with the climate change talks that just happened in Paris right. and are finally sitting down and trying to come up with solutions that move beyond their own borders but start within their own borders and mm -hmm. I think we need to um, as, as individual people we need to also consider that when we make decisions as a family what what our decisions what kind of impact they're having on the people around us and um, sometimes you have to do things that are best for your family but sometimes what's best for your family is also best for your community. And we just need to think that way more often. Right. And then that's what I say. We're actually all connected. No oh, matter where we are. Yeah, there. we're all connected. We're all influencing each other. Whatever you think might influence other people. And then I think it's, that's why being an expert, sometimes I let you see different things. The kids locally, how do they connect it with my kids from another country? How do they connect the culture differences? How did they how do they become friends? So yeah. from here, I have the last question, but I'm not the least. What is your top of the advice for parents and expat parents who are raising young world citizens? Listen to your kids. Your kids are smart, intelligent people, and um they know what they need um, when, when, when they're having trouble or they're, they need a good listening ear. Sometimes they're not looking for a solution from mom or dad. They're looking for a place to talk things out so they can find their own solution. And right. I think more parents need to listen to their children before they come up with answers and um, let things let things progress and let their kids communicate before they start telling them what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Angie, for joining us today. It's wonderful to hear your stories and your experience and then your, your photographs and then your experience, you know, when you travel around different countries and then your overseas living experience. And thank you very much for joining us today, Angie. Thank you for giving me a new format to share my passions. I and mean, this is wonderful. I've never done a Google Hangout, so this goes down as my first Google Hangout ever. And um, I hope it's not my last. I think there'll be more to come. It's so interesting. Thank you yes. so much, Amanda. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Angie. And thank you very much for watching this episode of Interview with Miss Panda. Have a wonderful day and happy holidays to all our friends around the world. Thank you. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. 再见. 我们下次见.